Hi, Gary. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Danielle. Nice to be here. It's an yeah. honor, actually. Oh, it's an honor for, for me sure. to have you here. <laughs> oh, well, I feel the same way. You're, you're quite re renowned, even over here, all oh. over the world. You have a great podcast and uh, you've had great guests on and I'm, I don't <clears throat> think I compare to those guests, but I'm glad you had, had me on anyway. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. But I think you do. <laughs> You've got such an illustrious career. But before we touch on that, I just wondered, where are you based now in the US? I'm based in Coronado, California, which is San Diego. And if you arrive in San Diego, there's a bridge right over 15 minutes from downtown where you land in the airport and you're at my house. And, and I look out my window and I'm looking at downtown San Diego, the Midway, uh, the um, aircraft carrier from World War II, and all the cruise ships that come in, it's a pretty awesome view. So wow. it's a great place to be. They have two 50 meter pools here and I work out of one of them primarily and swim in the other one. So it's a pretty good deal. That sounds lovely. When did you last get a swim in? It's been a little bit of a while. I don't know if you can see my right, right uh, arm is in a sling. Ah, yes. Um, but I had my right shoulder replaced one week ago actually. And uh, it was uh, bothering me. I, I could swim, but it was a little bit painful after the swim. So I went in, it was bone on bone. Um, fortunately, you know, I never had any problems with my shoulders when I swam. I, you know, four and I am, turn or fly. I was a distance guy, I, you know, and I did a lot of yards. But I don't think that had anything to do with this. I think it was um, my mother, bless her heart, may she rest in peace. Um, she was, uh, a great person with bad knees and bad shoulders. And wow. so I had my right knee replaced about five years ago. And I just decided, you know, it was so successful at the knee. And I love my surgeon. He's a great surgeon. And I said, you know what? He, he talked about some other athletes who were swimmers that he'd done 30 years ago and they're swimming every day, not having any problems. So I said, you know, I love swimming. He said, well, you need to get this fixed. Yeah. So, you know, it's nice that today we have replacement parts, right? Yeah, very nice. How, how long has he said you have to be out of the water for? I'll be out of the water for six weeks and then I get to start kicking. I can't actually start pulling for three months. I don't feel like it should take that long because honestly, this is one of the easiest things I've ever gone through. Right. And, and they, they put a whole new shoulder in there. It seems it sounds painful. And the knee was not an easy thing to go through, but the shoulder was, I mean, knock on wood, um, I'm one week out, but you know, it's really been rather easy to get through. And I was hoping he might, I might twist his arm and get him to allow me to swim sooner. I can't imagine going six, three months without swimming. That's, that's gonna be painful. Oh, I at least know. I can, at least I can kick. That's, I can work on the important <laughs> stuff like kicking, right? Oh. That's right. I know here in here in Melbourne, we've been in lockdown. So we've been out of the water for a while as well. We've just opened yeah. up in the last week. So. I, co I coach a few clients that I have in Australia and I've been aware of what they're doing. It's been very, very difficult, yeah. um, especially in Sydney and Melbourne. But, um, you know, I've got a, a young 15 year old and coaching an open water swimmer. Did okay. really well. Uh, Haley uh, is I think ranked number one as a 15 year old in the country in, in Australia. Right. And she was third in the most recent uh, senior, you know, open in yes. the open division. So she's a, she's a hard worker, really a fun project. Never actually seen her swim in life. You know, she's not come here and I've been not there, but I've been coaching her online now for eight months. Wow. And she's a wonderful girl. Uh, and, you know, everything I throw at her, she does, plus some. She just really works hard. Oh, and I have another another family over in the in Perth that I work with as well, and they're a family. Uh, great talent is a young swimmer, uh, young girl. The youngest, they're all talented. Probably the most talented is, is Tegan, who's only uh, thirteen, I believe. Uh, really a dynamo. She's going to be a great swimmer for Australia. Oh. So I'm dabbling. I'm I'm putting my my little tentacles out and reaching down under to to Australia to help. Some of the Australian swimmers, so it'll become great. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. We have so much to chat about, but I wanted to start with your college career. What was it like at Indiana University swimming under Doc Councilman? 
Um, well, first I want to tell you, coming from California, it was cold. <laughs> I wasn't used to that. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't even know. I'd never seen snow. I mean, I grew up in Southern California. I was like, what is this white stuff? You know, I mean, but uh, Doc was an amazing experience. Not just a great coach, but a great mentor. In fact, I wouldn't be coaching. You know, I can tell you honestly, I wouldn't be doing what I do now yeah. if it were not for Doc. Wow. He was inspiring. He was inquisitive. He was smart. He was um, funny. Great sense of humor. You don't hear that very often about him, but he, that was maybe his greatest attribute. Uh, but boy, he knew how to get the most out of his swimmers. He really was a psychologist. His PhD was in physiology. Right. But he was kind of a jack of all trades and he master psychologist, knew a, a lot about physics just self-taught, you know, he just read and read and read, but he was always questioning. So just to be around a guy like that was really fascinating. And at that time he was, he was uh, by far, well, you know, there were some great coaches. I shouldn't say by far, but he was certainly one of the greatest coaches, if not the best coach of that era. Yeah. It was a great, it was fun, fun experience to be there training. Yeah. You had lots of wonderful teammates as well. I've had Jim Montgomery on the, um, podcast previously were you there at the same time or is he a bit younger uh he's a little younger I recruited him I think he started when I graduated wow. and uh so I missed him by a year um he actually swam the same year as my brother-in-law who was my wife's younger brother who swam it was an Olympian also in that same 1976 team wow. uh, but Jim went on to in my opinion maybe become the greatest Masterson coach ever and really um, redefined how you coach masters. So he, did, he was one of the first to really specialize. There were others that had done it, but not many had yeah. specialized in just masters coaching. And man, he built up the, the Dallas area masters team. I think at that time they had, you know, uh, 800, 700, I'm not sure. They had a number of swimmers yeah. in different locations training. And others have come along and followed his model and, and you know, it's uh, it's great to see. Yeah, what was it like um, competing in the NCAA's year's competition? Um, well, first of all, in, in the era that I swam, the NCAA's, I wouldn't say was more um, meant more than it does today. It means a tremendous amount, especially to the D one schools that are vying for the championships. And there's usually eight to ten schools that you know are in that mix every year, and they're pretty much the same ones. Year in, year in and year out. And uh, because they have great coaches in those programs. Um, yeah. But the thing that disappoints me, because I went to the NC Toys and observed as a father when my son swam there, and I've seen him and watched him. It's, it's not the same event as it used to be. And the reason, and I don't know why, I, I think when I went, you couldn't get a seat. It, it was a packed house. It reminded me of Sydney in 2000, you know, the finals of that infamous first day with that you know, air guitar relay, when I couldn't even hear myself. That was the loudest I've ever been in any venue, including hard rock concerts. That was amazing, that last lap. I mean, I, I was like, oh my God, my head's gonna explode. Um, but you know, that's where the NC2As were back then. And I miss that. I, I, don't, I think they lost sight of how to make the event spectator friendly or bring people in and, and make it exciting, but it used to be so much better than it is now from a spectator standpoint. Yeah. Most of the spectators now are the, are the swimmers and the parents and they just don't, they don't focus on, um, you know, the, the spectators or making it an event. Yeah. You know, it's, it's still a great event. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Uh, but I, I love the, the excitement of the crowds in those days, which you don't see anymore. I haven't seen it in decades really. Yeah. Uh, as far as you know, an event goes, I mean, swimming has changed so much. In those days, when you got to be a senior in college, that was pretty much the end of your career. In fact, the women were just beginning to have collegiate swimming. So they, they got to high school, through high school, and that was like, okay, there's nothing left for me. Thank God that's changed. You know, with the NC2As now and Title IX, with, you know, women having equal numbers of scholarships. But in those days, you know, you got through college and you were pretty much finished your career. So it was a focal point in, in a career. Today, you go on to post-grad to train, continue your career, 
hopefully swim for life and become a master swimmer. Yes. You know, that's the goal is never get out, just keep going. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, I think, I think the NC2A is, uh, is still important, perhaps not as important because in those days you only had one Olympics for us, we didn't have Commonwealth Games. We had the Pan, the, uh, uh, Pan American Games. So it was one year of the Olympics, one year of the Pan Am Games. There wasn't even a World Championships when I saw it. It was in 1983 that that started. And then it was an off year, and then it was an Olympic year. Yeah. But the NC Twice was every year, and it was always a big event. It was a, you know, especially if you were on a team and, and you had a chance to win it and all that. So very exciting. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, you represented the US in 68, 72 and 76 and won three medals. I wanted to talk about that very first silver medal that you won in the 400 IM. Tell us about that race. Well, first of all, I was 16 when I made that Olympic team. And, and I, like a year and a half before that, I was pretty much ready to quit swimming. I was down and out. Um, got lucky, found a new coach who was amazing, you know, showed me how to train like the Olympians train and, and really brought the whole, my whole focus onto the IM. I'd never swum an IM before. I'm an extinct IMer, by the way. There may be a few masters like me left, but they're, today, they're, nobody wins the IM if you don't have a great breaststroke. I had a terrible breaststroke. <laughs> but I was so good in the other three that I could still manage to somehow win the event most of the time. Uh, but, you know, I, I focused on that event and my coach said, do you want to make the Olympic team in 68? I'm, I'm ready to quit. I'm just like down and out. I'm a puny little run 15 year old. And uh, he said, no, I think you got, you got some potential. Um, you just got to go for the lowest hanging fruit. I said, what's that? He said, the 400 IM, nobody wants to swim that event. And it's still true today. Well, not as much, but in Masters, it's still true. You want to get a place in a, in a meet and as a Masters, you enter the 400 IM. You got a pretty good shot at it. You know, nobody else is going to do that. But anyway, um, I said, well, I don't have a breastwork. He said, well, we'll try to fix that. And he did. I never did get very good in breaststroke, and I didn't know exactly how, nor did he to improve it. Um, but I ended up going to Mexico. I, I played second to a guy named Charlie Hickox. And I, you know, I was, I, everybody that went on the US team, every one of us got sick with Montezuma's revenge. It was, I mean, it was Mexico and that's what happens, right? And they told us to wash our hands. And then they said, when you get in the pool, don't drink any pool water. It's like, sure, right, you know, come on. But I, I we all got sick anyway. And I got sick like three days before the 400 AM. It was the first event I swam to. Turn her back was at the end. And, um, you know, I, I felt like I had a shot to win it, but the altitude really was tough. You know, 7,000 feet, 400 AM was hard. Anyway, um, I got sick. My dad came in from, he was a physician, flew in from California. You know, I was like laying on the bed, white as a ghost. He gave me some antibiotics. I was like better the next day. Two days later, I was feeling okay, pretty good. Got up, swam the prelims, and, and then went to the finals the next night. Um, pretty much healed. And, you know, I had a shot to win that. I, I should have probably won it. But I, I remember coming out of the last turn, Danielle, and I, Charlie was a fierce competitor. He was also an Indiana guy, by the way. But he was four years older than I was. Anyway, so... It's you're hurting bad. You're coming off that last wall of the 400 AM, and it's like, get me home. Where's that wall? I just got to get there. And I remember taking a breath, and I breathed to my left, and Charlie breathed to his right, and we both came off that wall, dead even. And I'm looking over, and he's looking at me at the exact same time. And I remember putting my head down and saying, "Oh God, this hurts so bad." But I tell you what, I said, "I'm going to take one more stroke." And then I'm, I'm going to dig in and I'm going for it. And I'm going to sprint to the wall and I'm going to, I'm going to win that gold medal. So I take one more stroke to get a nice breath of air so I could put my head down and go for it. And I saw it was a suit. He had done the same thing I did one stroke earlier. Oh. And I couldn't catch him. And he ended up winning the goal. I was three tenths behind him. But wow, so close. 
Yeah. Great honor just to be there. I didn't expect to be there. First, imagine that qualified for your first international meet representing the United States. You're in the Olympic Games. It's like, you know, pitching in the in the World Series for the first time. You know, then you get to pitch. Oh, you're in the seven, game seven of the World Series here. Here's the ball. But sometimes, you know, when you're young and you don't know any better, it's the best position to be. Yeah. And I had no fear. I, I, you know, I didn't, no expectations. Nobody expected me to win. Um, I was, you know, a contender, but it was a great position to be in. Did that sort of, did that um, sort of innocence in that first Olympics, did that change when you knew what was happening when you went back for the other two? Were you more sort of anxious or nervous? Well, it left me, it left me hungry because I, I knew I wanted to win. I wanted to, you know, get a gold medal. That was kind of my goal. Somehow, I had to get a gold medal. And uh, so the 400 IM became kind of my event. And, and, and uh, shortly after the Olympics, I swam and then the next summer, broke the world record and, and kept the world record, dropped the time by almost nine seconds from the wow. to where I, I set it. And I set it in the trials during the 72. Never lost a race. You know, it was kind of my event. The guys that were behind me were pretty far behind. They were three, four, five seconds slower. But I won't even tell you the time because they were so slow. The women's are fa the times are faster today. Uh, but anyway, we were, um, you know, it was all relative, I guess, but I went to Munich and that was probably one of the toughest lessons I ever had in my life. A very valuable life lesson. It was a hard day for me. Yeah. Uh, but I, but I qualified for three events there, two fly, four I am, two I am. And I also swam the, the hunter fly and then the relay in the prelims. I only got to swim the prelims. Uh, the two hundred fly on the first day I swam a, a what I thought was a great race. You know, I, I, I was silver medaled again behind Mark Spitz. Mark was just better. And I, I thought maybe I had a shot to beat him. He was kind of sneaky in that he never showed his cards until, you know, the big races. So he was always faster than everybody thought he was because he never really put it out unless he really wanted to. And he was just a great swimmer of the day. I couldn't have beaten him at the time he won at the time, but I did go my best time, got second, so I'm a smart race, didn't get sucked into trying to beat him. I just, I kept my cools. Two days later, I come back in the 400 IM and did the exact opposite. I mean, I, I got up in the morning, felt cruddy. I didn't sleep, you know, I was kind of thinking the night before, oh my gosh, 400 IM, that's tomorrow. That's my event, I'm supposed to win that, you know? So I was already in a bad state of mind. Tossed and turned all night, didn't sleep. Went over the prelims and swam really, really badly. Qualified for the finals, but like fourth or fifth, which is very uncharacteristic. I had the world record going in. Right. I could have kept my composure, I could have, but I didn't. And instead I panicked. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm going to lose this race as soon as I touch the wall after prelims. That was like the worst thing you could do, right? Yeah, but I couldn't shake that thought, and I never really could relax. Didn't eat all day. I tried to eat, got nauseated, almost threw up. My fiance, who's now my wife of forty-eight years, tried to console me. Doc counselman came in, tried to console me. Looked our my coach, tried to console. Me. Nobody could. I mean, I was just like, you know, you could see I was just choking in front of their eyes. And I ended up, you know, getting fifth. I went out really scared and fast. And I bonked in the middle. I hadn't, didn't have any energy because I didn't eat. So it was a valuable, valuable. It was very depressing. I remember just thinking, you know, I, nobody beat me. And they didn't even break my world record. They were, it was a great race, by the way. It was one of the uh, most interesting races in Olympic history because the two guys that beat me, or more than two, but the two guys who tied for first, Tim McKee and, and Gunnar Larson from Sweden. Tim was American. He was you know, sitting next to me and passed me up in the breaststroke. And, um, I, you know, I'd never lost to Tim McKee until the Olympics. But he hits the wall and they had the exact same time with a hundredth of a second. Oh. And then they both had number one next to their names. So they both think they win, which today, and ever since 1984 or earlier, that's a rule. You tied with a hundredth of a second, they're both, you know, as soon as you get the gold medal, it happened in Sydney with Gary Jr., Anthony Irvin, 50 meters, same time, the hundredth of a second. Gold medal. They don't even tell them anymore what the time was to the thousandth, even though they get it. 
But in those days, they looked at the, I don't know what it was, Omega or whoever was the timing system. And they and it and it showed the time to the thousandth of a second. And it turned out that Larson had beaten the key in that race by two one thousandths of a second, according to the Omega timing system. Well, it turns out that system has a bigger margin of error than the thousands really can, you know, yeah. decipher, determine. So in, in theory, they should have been both given the gold medal. You know, Tim, who I think actually lives in Australia now, is a good oh, friend of mine. Uh, still a bit, a bit bitter about that, yeah. rightfully so. Uh, I don't know if it'll ever be rectified, but he should be given the gold medal. He was, you know, he deserved it. Except the guy looked up, I swear, 10 yards from the wall, he looked up and, 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 and Larson's way over, like five lanes over. And he does like this water polo head lift to see where he is, puts his head down, sprints into the wall. And I said, Tim, if you just hadn't lifted your head up, this wouldn't even be an issue. You would have won this thing flat out. You know? yeah. Anyway, uh, so then I swam 200 IM, broke the world record in the 200 IM and got fourth. Wow. And, and I didn't, I, you know, I broke my best time by a second. Can't feel bad about that, my, my goal time. But I got fourth. There were three guys that just went better. Yeah. And, and Gunnar Larson won that one too. And so, you know, it was a disappointing Olympics from not winning. Although I have to, I did help the US team win the medley relay by swimming the prelims. Today, if you swim the prelims and the medley relay and your team wins the gold, you get a gold. Back in those days, you got a handshake or a slap on the back, um, you know, or, or you were reprimanded for not getting them in the finals. But today, uh, they get the gold or the silver or the bronze. We didn't, so I never got a gold medal. But it's okay. I, I, I can live with that. Yeah. Great honor. Great, great experience. Wouldn't have gone to Montreal. If I'd won there, I would have wrapped it up, gone on to medical school, said, you know, that was a nice career. I'm done with that. And I would never have had the greatest honor of my life. So in a way... You know, you don't always know what happens to you is good or bad. In this case, it turned out to be a good thing. Yeah. Because I ended, I ended up uh, in Montreal carrying the U.S. flag and opening ceremonies. Great, great honor, which I'm extremely proud of. Yeah. And um, that wouldn't have happened if I if I didn't come back and try again. Yeah. So, yeah. I was going to ask you about that with the with the flag bearer. What was that atmosphere like when you walked into the Olympic Stadium? electrifying it, it, you know yeah. it, Montreal being close to the US there were a lot of Americans there in the stadium Queen Elizabeth was there you know it was a big deal and we walked for like almost a mile to get there you know people kind of you know clapping along the way and the crowds got bigger and bigger and then you walk down this tunnel and they file you an order you know the US is toward the end so we were kind of in alphabetical order uh, you know toward the last um, you walk, I just remember walking, there's like maybe 20 rows deep, people cheering in the U.S., oh, all right, go, you know, go Yanks, go get them. And then you walk down this tunnel and it's kind of dark and, and then you kind of go through this, you're going under the stadium and then you see the light at the end of the tunnel, literally here. Uh, and you walk out and it's like this deafening roar because the first thing that comes out of the tunnel is the U.S. flag when they see the stars and stripes. And people just went to their feet and just screamed and, and, and uh, it was thundering. And I remember shaking. I was, I was so nervous. I was afraid I was going to drop the flag, uh, <laughs> but somehow managed to hang on to it. Yeah. Uh, but what a, what a great honor it was to, to yeah. lead that team. Great team. Amazing. Uh, Is it yeah. quite heavy, the flag, to hold? You know, every, everybody thinks that. I remember when the Russian guy had it straight out here like that and he held it. Yes. I was too embarrassed to do that because my arms were smaller than the flagpole. And I thought, that'll look weird to see this guy. It's like a broken flagpole. Um, they're actually really light. And, and those flags are like made out of tissue paper. So they look great, but I think they'd be totally disintegrated in a week if you took them home. Right. And they're just, they're made on purpose that way to be really, really light. So they're not really flags like you'd fly in front of your house or, you know, at the stadium. They're not like that at all. And uh, it's, it's a broomstick, 
basically. I could have actually done that and probably lasted all the way around the stadium. I didn't have the same muscle that the Russian guy did, but um, it wasn't like impressive at all. In fact, you, you got the flag and you think, huh, that's it? You know, like, <laughs> God, that's, yeah. that's, not, that's not cool. <laughs> but then after you after you carried it for a couple of miles, you say, ah, I'm kind of glad it's light. Yeah, because it always looks really heavy on TV. People really struggle with it. So holding it up like this. Yeah. It's all show. It's all always show. show. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Good to know. <laughs> and and being a 400 IM swimmer and then swimming, you mentioned the 200 back and um, obviously the 100 and 200 fly. Did that training just come about with your four 400 IM training or did you specifically train for those other events? You know, I was always, I think the best stroke uh, as a youngster, you know, when I was nine, 10, I was probably my fly was always my best stroke and then backstroke would have been second three, but I was pretty good in all three of those. Yeah. And then breaststroke was like pff, really bad. I didn't have the right tools for breaststroke. I couldn't kick. And that was, um, I didn't know how to fix that. I do now. I wish I turn the clock back and try but you know anyway i i um you know i excelled in in all three of those different races but as i got older uh when i was in medical school and i decided to come back for one more try i only gave myself nine months to train i'd been out for three years right. and i really i didn't give myself enough time really and in fact those were probably the longest periods of my life where i didn't swim at all and studying and you know getting fat and lazy um and not a very good lifestyle when you're studying in medical school and you're you know up every third night all that stuff was taking its toll but i decided hey, in nine months i could do it i could get back so i i really pushed I, I probably didn't allow myself enough time but i only swam one event i was 100 flying so i said you know i can't train for the two i fly i can't train for the four i am anymore just don't have the time or the energy or the desire. So I'm going to train for one and I'm going to see if I can get faster and stronger. I did a lot of weight training uh, the summer before I started swimming. Got pretty, pretty bulked up and got heavier, but I, um, you know, and, and that helped me a lot in, in the 100 fly. Uh, but, you know, it was a little easier focusing on just one event rather than three or four. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to talk a bit, obviously, about your coaching. Tell us what led you into creating the race club. Uh, I know you created it with Gary Jr., but how did that all come about and how did you get into coaching? Well, uh, I never really left the sport of swimming. Even when I retired, um, I started doing triathlons, and so I swam on a regular basis. Um, I never stayed in really great, got in great shape, but I never got out of shape either. Um, and I love swimming. So even as it was a practicing position, um, we, um, I always swam, you know, it was just something and it was great for my health, uh, for my fitness, for my mind. And our kids, you know, got into swimming, but um, when we moved to Phoenix where I practiced, uh, my father-in-law, my wife's father built a pool there. And that's when our kids really got involved in the sport. And I sort of managed the programs at that point. I managed, um, you know, the master's program, the, the, uh, the age group swimmers, the uh, learn to swim program. I, I mean, I didn't do it myself, but I managed, oversaw the whole thing. Uh, I didn't coach them. I just tried to find the best coaches I could for my own children, because I wanted to have the best shot they could at becoming fast. And uh, for Gary Jr., you know, we you know, came across Mike Bottom, who even to this day, I consider to be one of the most creative and uh, best coaches in, in, in history. Um, he and Gary just resonated and, and Gary loved his coaching style and just, you know, did really well with him. Um, but um, for me coaching, it really came about until, not until I decided to leave medicine. And I left medicine in 2005 at the end of 2005, moved to Florida. Um, and when I got there, I was there a couple of years observing the race club. The race club had actually been founded uh, in 2003 by Gary Jr. And 
so I just, you know, I, I helped it, supported it, but I wasn't there really. They, they had moved down to Florida. Uh, the prior years, we had done a similar thing. We called the World Team in uh, in Phoenix, but now we we called the race. We called it the race club. The goal of it initially was to train great swimmers to try to give them the best shot of getting on the podium. But in 2008, um, Mike took the job at the University of Michigan as head coach. All of our assistant coaches decided to go and got great job offers and they went. And so we had this history of coaching, I think over 55 Olympians in wow. four successive Olympics. And uh, winning, I think we won 23 Olympic medals uh, with our swimmers. And we, we came to a kind of a, a fork in the road where it was either we throw in the towel and said, you know, we had a great run. Gary decided to retire after 2008. He was no longer in the sport. Um, you know, we'd had foundational support that kind of dried up. And I said, you know, we either, and we've learned so much and I, you know, I just don't want to throw it all away. Yeah. And, you know, I, so we decided let's, let's teach others what we've learned yeah. through this experience. You know, I said, well, you're the last man standing, Gary. You're either the coach, you know, or we're going to throw in the tent and fold it up. And I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. That's when I started coaching around 2008. And uh, started, you know, the race club in its present form, which is a teaching institution. And we run camps and private instruction. And now we do online coaching. And we, we have a subscription service where we have videos where we teach the important fundamentals of technique. Um, you know, when I started this, I said, okay, if I'm going to coach, I don't really want to coach a traditional team in the traditional sense. I'm a science guy. I'm a physician. I love the science, but I felt, and largely because of that, that there needed to be better science, more science in the sport, more research. And so, you know, slowly we developed and invested in technology. I learned more about, you know, what is it that makes some swimmers fast and others not so fast. And we just started applying that and learning and, and writing and, and videoing and teaching. And, and uh, that's what we do. And we do it all year round. Um, we move, we'll have our last camp in Florida in November. And then all of our camps and instruction will be based in California. Okay. Back to your home state. That's good. <laughs> Full circle. Yeah. Um, California, Indiana, Phoenix, Arizona, Florida, back to California. Yeah. But the, the beautiful thing, all my kids live here or will live here soon. Yes. And my grandkids, and that's a that's a real blessing. I mean, that's yeah. and that's that's the great draw. I would have lived anywhere if my kids were there. I'd like to go wherever they are. Yeah. It's good to be in your family, absolutely. Yes, and it is. I I know the race club have got, um, you've got a sort of a joint initiative with um, US Masters Swimming. How does, what does that entail? Well, we love Masters. Um, I've always been a Masters swimmer since I retired and, and I don't compete that often. Um, and, and of late I have because of my knee and my shoulder, but yeah. um, we've always been supportive of the Masters and I, I love the Masters camps we do. They're so fun. Um, we, we do them differently than the eight to 18 year olds, you know, that are, have a different goal, different abilities, different flexibility, um, different mindset. But the, the masters that come to our camps are really driven. And, you know, they, they, want, they want to get better. And many of them have never had much teaching about technique. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it, to me, it's been really, really a fun part of what I do. And we do one in the spring and one in the fall. And, uh, you know, everyone has gotten better and bigger. And I think eventually we'll probably expand to do more. Um, we, um, we felt that, you know, Master Swimming in the US was a good partnership for us. It was the right partnership for us. Um, COVID hit at the wrong time with that partnership. So we had to put it all on hold. Uh, and so we haven't gotten really back into full swing with them, uh, but, you know, I think master swimming is um, has a lot more potential than it than it has shown so far. One of the most exciting things I'm doing right now is developing an app, which is going to be used with the Apple Watch, and eventually we'll have it work with anything. 
Right. But but it, it, it enables you to put in very sophisticated and complicated workouts with all the equipment you use. And from that, I'll be able to monitor swimmers wherever they are in the world. And we're trying to build communities. Trying, we want to become the peloton of, of swimming. So yeah. we're going to have, you know, audio device, uh, coach's voice in it, communication device, um, workouts that are subscribed. You know, it's going to be fun. And behind that is teaching them the technique, whether they can come to a camp or not. Through this app, they'll have access to some tutorials, some videos. Wow. But if they want to dig dip deeper, then they subscribe to the race club on a monthly basis. I think we have 350 videos of four to six minutes, eight minutes. Um, phenomenal videos. My son does all the videography, yeah. but science-based, evidence research-based, and good quality, really good quality. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen them or not, but they're they're uh, I have they're our pride. Uh, not yeah. I'm not subscribed, but I, I do follow you and I've seen um, little snippets of them here and there. There was a lovely one that I um, when I first got back into master swimming, I'd lost a lot of flexibility. And I remember there was one that you had, it must have been filmed down in Florida, um, of a guy doing lots of sort of activation, mobilization, flexibility stuff on the side of the pool. And I used that as a bit of a guide <laughs> to get back in. Oh, good. So yeah. tight. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's a good example of what we do in a master's camp. I don't do the same flexibility, you know. Uh, stretching for them than I do with the 8 to 18 year olds. You know, we don't do the same um, if butterfly, we teach it differently for masters than we do for 18 year, 18 year olds. There are some masters that can do the elite butterfly, but not many. And so we have kind of these options. Well, here's a technique that works that makes it, yeah. you know, easy and not, not easy. That's a bad word. It makes it doable so that you can live to talk about it at the end of the race. You know? <laughs> And uh, so we like to focus, as, and it's only been a couple of years since we've done the masters only camps. I mean, we used to have masters mixed in with eight or nine year olds and they were very good sports about it. You know, we wouldn't have them in the same lane, but they might be three or four lanes over. And they were, they were always trying to keep, uh, keep up with the younger kids that we had. But the reality is the camp focus has to be different. Masters are different. They're older, their needs are different. Yeah. Uh, starts is a great example. You can't, I love Brad Tandy start. I love Caleb Dressel. So that's a gold standard. There are a few masters have actually been able to successfully do that start, but not many. And yeah. most of them, if I try to teach that, I have to put a little warning at the beginning, you know, proceed at your own risk because it's, it's a very challenging start to do. And yeah. a few end up with, you know, shoulders that are, couldn't get out of bed the next day. <laughs> So what would you advise with that, with a start like that? What, what kind of tips do you give people? Well, you have to take the swimmer. The age is very important. I mean, some, if they're, and we've, we've coached up to in the mid eighties, but I've had some that, you know, you help them up with the block and they do a two foot forward start because they need that for balance, you know, and they can't go down and on the flexibility down and grab the front of the starting block. So you, they do the trophy start because that's as good as it gets. So how do you teach them how to start better? Well, by not, you know, belly flopping when they come in, just get the head down, make up the best streamline you can, point your toes, get in the water cleanly and get up and get going. And, and you can teach anyone to start better. Most of the starts at the master's level. I, it's funny because if you want a tutorial on the history of starts, go to a master's championships, world championships, and you see the 25 year olds guys, the 25 to 30 year olds, and they're doing pretty much the same start as the elite athletes are now, right? Yeah. And then you get to the nine-year-olds, it's the same start they used in 19, you know, 45 or 50 or whatever. You know, they're, it's like, it's an evolution of the start with every increasing age, you see the start kind of go back in time. It's like they never relearned how to start. They just do the same start they used to do. Yeah. Uh, but a lot has changed on that start. And, uh, you know, we love to, I love to teach, teach it because everybody needs help on it. It's, it's still a glamour part of the technique. You don't, I mean, you do a great start and a bad start, and you're maybe one or two tenths difference between those time ones. That's enough to win or lose a race. So it justifies learning how to do it well. And you love to be out in front when you get up. 
but I just love improving because there's so many mistakes being made. If you can make three or four things better, yeah, they're not going to get to Brad or kill him. Nobody does. I mean, those guys are 41 inch vertical jumps. I mean, they're not going to do that. My vertical jump, you measure in millimeters, not inches. <laughs> okay. And it's like, <laughs> same. <laughs> so, but you know, you take that's what's fun about coaching technique is you have to take the athlete and you t we test them. We, we go through these 45 minutes of stretching to find out what their tools are. We rate them on a scale of zero to 10 in every one of the categories from the ankles to the knees, to the quads, the, the, the hamstrings, the hips, the core, the lower back, the cervical spine, the shoulders. I think I got them all, but we, we give a rating on every single one of those. They're wow. all important in, in, in swimming. Uh, but breaststroke, for example, totally different requirements to do well than yeah. freestyle butterfly and backstroke. So we like to know what we have to work on. And then they, they say, oh, how, do I, how do I improve my tools? Yeah. How, do I, how do I make them better? Well, here are the stretches that you're gonna have to do or should do in order to change your flexibility. Yeah. Uh, flexibility we've always known is important, but I, I think I appreciate it more now than ever before because it is absolutely essential in some sports or some strokes like breaststroke. You don't have internal rotation of the hip. You don't have pronation of the ankle. You're not kicking. Fast. I don't yeah. care how strong your legs are, because you, you're you're a tomahawk chop, you know, with your feet going backwards. You yeah. don't have that surface area to push with. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. I I know um Laura Vell um came on the podcast and she mentioned that she'd been um been down and done one of your um underwater clinics. Oh, under I think she she was filmed underwater and she raved about it. She loved it. Uh, she's my hero. That girl. <laughs> she's a I mean player. I don't think anyone will ever break her record of world records I don't know what she's up to now but it's uh, like 350 or something crazy oh, yeah it's something world records yeah. I mean imagine and a second place I think is uh maybe Carly um, Carly yeah yeah Carlin Carlin is, is second and she only has, she has like 212 or 230 yeah. I don't know it's like 130 behind I don't know how she's gonna she's younger than Laura but Gosh, that's it's amazing what Laura has done. Yeah. But the, the most amazing thing about Laura was breaking six world records in one race. Yeah, I know. Can you imagine? That? That's, I imagine. that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Who can do that? I don't know. Wow. I know because she was she was telling me it was feet on the wall. She didn't she didn't touch. She didn't touch with her hand. No. Still broke the world record. Yeah. And just kept going. Yeah. And um, broke the fifty, the hundred, the two hundred the 400, the 800, and the 1500 record all in one, one swim. It's amazing. Uh, her pacing might have been a little weird. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> cool. We're going to sprint this 1500 <laughs> fast as you can. First 50. Yeah. She's, she's in such good shape. It didn't matter. She could, yeah, she she could do whatever she wants. She, yeah. she trains. But uh, yeah, she and Rich Burns came down as a, and had a fun time with them. Great, yeah. great to cook. Love coaching masters. I just I love it. It's, yeah. You know, I don't. I checked my ego at the at the door a long time ago, and you know we have masters sometimes. Or few triathletes, not many. Triathletes are a little different breed. They're, it's a different thing. So that's a not. We don't do much of that, but we do have occasional triathletes who come in. It's mostly the masters, and some are you know really just starting out. And they barely can get across the pool. Um, yeah. I take as much pride in, in making them reach their goals as I do you know, Maggie McNeil, who we coached and helped through the, to, to win the gold medal in the Olympic Games. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, as a, and I was teaching her technique when she was 11, 12, 13 years old. I don't take credit for her winning. Mike Bottom really should take that and, and her coach up in Michigan. But, um, you know, I, I take just as much pride in someone who's struggling to learn how to do a flip turn, yeah. you know, and how do I do this? How do I get through this? I mean, this is, seems inordinately complicated to me as a new swimmer, but to me, it's like, oh, I'll just do it. You know? But no, you have to break it down into components. Yeah. We don't just teach them to be, flip, to do flip turns. We teach them to do it the elite way to do it, you know, and, and a lot of even the elite swimmers make mistakes on the turns and starts. So we're not intimidated by anyone's ability or level. And I would take, 
I mean, I could take Caleb Dress. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling the truth. Yeah. And I've never tested him with our technology, but it's like looking at a swimmer under a microscope for the first time. Yes. No one's ever seen all this stuff. It becomes apparent with the technology we have. So we can take even a swimmer like Caleb and, and find things he's doing wrong. Now, he doesn't do many things wrong. Yeah. But gosh, you can find mistakes being made across the board. Yeah. So we're not afraid to look at anyone. And I tell anyone, if you know, when I do these studies, if I don't find anything to prove you, it'll be the first time. Yeah. And I haven't, I haven't found anyone yet who's perfect. Um, and, and most of the time, there's four or five or six take homes from every you know, stroke we do on the study. We say, you need to change this, 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 and this to get faster. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's been a great joy to have this technology. I, I want to thank publicly Nunzio Lenate from Italy, um, also um, Ari uh, in Finland, who developed TrainSense, has is, is got smart paddles. I'm using those now to measure the force on the hands. But um, with Nunzio, I started with him, great technology. Uh, which, just learned how to use it better. He's a, he's a modern pentathlete by history, uh, an engineer, very smart guy, but he didn't really understand swimming as well as we did. And so we kind of taught him how to use his own technology, which he's very grateful to, yeah. but he's, he's been using it. It's now being used all over the world. Um, when I wrote my book, The Fundamentals of Fast Swimming, I gave really a lot of credit to learning what I know now and understand about the sport. Yeah. from Nunzio and his AP labs and their technology. Right. Here, here's a scenario for you. So if if it goes ahead next year, the FINA World Masters will follow the World Championships in Fukuoka. If you were a master swimmer and you've been out of the water for a while with lockdown or whatever, you know, life getting in the way, what would you advise someone with seven months out to do in their training? to improve, to get to Fukuoka, to be successful? Maybe. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, when, we, when we do our camps, we have five different areas that we teach, five disciplines, I call it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one we, we teach the least, which we're very capable of teaching, but most swimmers that come to us have a pretty good swimming program, training, swimming training program. Mm -hmm. And around the world, not every master swimmer does, by the way, but most of the you know, the eight to 18 year olds that come to us are coming from a fairly good club where they're working out. And sometimes they're, they're doing it the wrong way, but that's okay. But they get a pretty good base training. But the mental training, the strength training, the nutrition, and the recovery aspects, those other four parts of the training are almost like neglected. Yes. Nobody talks about them. So the first thing, if I say, okay, Danielle, you're swimming at the Fukuoka in seven months. And seven months for me is a long chapter. I don't call seasons seasons, I call them chapters because you are writing your book as you live it. And every time you finish a championship meet, you close the book on that chapter and you start a new one. You don't look back, you, you glean from it what you can. You don't dwell on the past. You look forward to the next one. I like my chapters to be three to four months, but when you're training for a big event like the World Championships, you really should start even sooner than that. Seven months is a reasonable amount of time. But what you have to do in those seven months is really important. And that is not only have you got to, you have to train and you have to remember those five disciplines because if you're only doing a swim program and you don't have a strength program or a mental training tough, toughness program or your nutrition is bad or you have no recovery program, you aren't going to do well or as well as you would if you incorporated all those. You don't have to have a coach in all five. You just have to have a program. You have to learn, what do I need to do to improve my recovery time? Yeah. What do I need to do to improve my nutrition? You know, what do I, what's gonna make my body swim faster? Uh, what do I need to do to swim fast in training? Do I do, you know, USRPT or HITS training or do I go aerobic or anaerobic threshold? You know, what am I swimming? Am I going to focus on the 50 and the 1500? I hope not. Some do. Laura could do all, all of those and win. Yeah. <laughs> but most are going to say, no, I'm doing like, you know, these three events or four events and that's it. And these are my, my special, these are my best ones. So stay focused on the events. Don't try to do it all. Pick yeah. your top two or three events. 
but know how to train for those events. And, and all swimming events, even the 50 require some aerobic training. Yeah. You know, we're all, in, everybody's enamored and, and, you know, we all want to swim fast with the least amount of time expended, right? And maybe energy expended too. That just doesn't happen. So even in a 50, the last 10 meters or 20 meters of that race, very aerobic. If you don't train hard enough, you might have a great 25, but the last 15 is not going to be so pretty. Yes. So the first thing we do is try to build the right swimming program. Yeah. incorporate a good strength program and at any age a nine-year-old i would tell them you need strength and flexibility program and in, incorporate it yeah three times a week or even more in some cases yeah. um you know i tell them how to recover faster getting sleep you know changing their lifestyle nutrition mm-hmm. and and then we we build that program but the often the missing piece of this for the master swimmers is the competition they don't race enough I think, okay, I'm going to train really, really hard. I'm going to go to Fugo. I haven't raced in three months, but I'm going to get up there and I'm going to go for it. Uh-uh. Your body's going to go into shock when you do that. Yeah. Sure. I mean, you, you have to prepare to race by racing. Yeah. It's different than training. I don't care if you do a quality lactate set or you go up and say, okay, I'm going to do 450s on five minutes all out. It's not the same as going to meet, warming up, sitting around for an hour and a half and getting up on the block and going. That's a different mm. physiology. Yes. That's a different, that's a different requirement. And you have to learn how to do that. The body has to be adapted to that stress level. And so racing, that's why we call ourselves a race club. I mean, we want you to race to get faster in, in your championship meet. You need to go to you know, ideally one a month, maybe more, but one a month will do it. And sometimes you can't find one meet a month, especially during lockdowns and COVID. Yes. Hard to find a place to go and train, let alone compete. Yeah. But I would tell that person to tr- try to find, you know, at least six meets to go to, five or six meets before the change of meet and, and, and get yourself ready by doing that. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then the five disciplines of training, make sure you have the program in all five and you don't have one you need it that's what we do lane four yeah we, we're online coaches we, we we you know i've got master swimmers in several countries right now that i'm training yeah. for their next big event uh, and some i've never seen you know here in coronado i've never seen swim but i've seen videos of them yes it's, it's not ideal but it's it's you can tell a lot from a video yeah you can definitely no, that, that's uh, that's very good advice. I think a lot of um, people listening would would uh, take a lot from that. That's wonderful. Um, as a little bit of an aside, I just wanted to ask you, and I hope it's okay. I was going to ask you, um, I, I know you mentioned you were out here for the 2000 Olympics, and I know your son, Gary Hall Jr., was joking when he <laughs> said he was going to play the Aussies like guitars. Um what was your take on all that? Because over here, the media took that up as, um, you know, a bit of a sledge. And obviously, when the Aussies did beat the US, um, they were playing their guitars on the <laughs> on the pool deck. What did you think? Oh, I remember. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wrote about this in, in a book I just wrote. I wrote the, the textbook of on something called Fundamentals of Fast Swimming that you know, and COVID started, I thought it was the last couple of months and everything, we, you know, so it went on and on. Mary, my wife said, Gary, write a book. You're not coaching. You can't coach. Do something. And so you're going to drive me crazy. <laughs> so I started writing fundamentals, 280 pages. And, and it, I really felt good about the book, but I finished it. Yep. COVID's still here. You know, I'm thinking, well, now I can't go back and coach you. So she had write another book. So I'd written this book 15 years ago and I rewrote it. And I incorporated the chapter about the Gary and the Aussies, you know, and, the, and smash them like guitars. Yeah. It was taken, everything in that, you know, was, I mean, the, 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 the Aussies played that to the hilt. They, they took that, posted it in the locker rooms. I mean, it was like classic warfare, you know, jargon. This is war, you know, we're going to battle with you guys over this. And, uh, you know, in, in retrospect, I'm sure Gary, in fact, it was totally uh, taken out of context because he was writing a blog for NBC at the time. Right. And he's a very good writer. And he was just, you know, Gary loves to just talk and, and he's very good. 
but he loves to just say things. Uh, and, and this kind of came to his mind, but it, if you read the blog, what he's saying was, you know, we got an awesome relay, you know, but we're gonna face a great challenge from Australia. And, but he said, in the end, I think we can smash them like guitars or something like that. Wow. You know, basically <laughs> he was saying, we got a formidable task ahead of us. Yeah. But that ever, not part of it never came out. It was all, <laughs> the only thing was, Gary Hall Jr. said, Americans are gonna smash the Aussie like guitars and the 400 <laughs> free And uh, that was one of the most exciting races uh, in, in history. I, I have to say, and not just, you know, obviously Australians who were there at the stadium watched it, and, you know, amazing just with, but I've watched that race many, many times. There were six changes of leads in that race. Yes. In eight laps, there was, the lead changed almost every, every single lap of the race. Mm -hmm. you know, and it was U.S., Australia's ahead, U.S. is ahead, Australia. And then in the end, I mean, and I keep reminding everybody that Gary went behind him. You know, he was, he left uh, half a second behind him. Actually had, I think, the fastest split, Gary did, not Ian. But, yeah. you know, uh, the thing that I think, and, and I'm not defending, uh, it, was, it was a great, great victory for, for Australia. And I think Ian Thorpe has publicly said, it was his most memorable of it. And he swam so many amazing races, but that one he considers and cherishes as his most memorable victory, mm -hmm. Olympic gold. Um, but Gary, a year before the, um, the Sydney Olympics was diagnosed with type one diabetes, not making excuses for him, nor, nor would he. Uh, yeah. and, and after going to two or three endocrinologists, he finally found one that said, Gary, you can still try for the hundreds. Two or three had said, mm -mm, don't even go for it. Don't even make an attempt it's not going to happen right. he found a, a woman in, at ucla who was amazing and she guided him to how to train with diabetes for the right. but he, they collectively along with mike bottom the coach decided no 100 53 that's it you're going to go for one of them right that's really all the time you have to train for and we don't think that it's wise that you be swimming like 100 with diabetes yeah so he did. That's all he trained for. Was a fifty. He didn't train for hundred. They went to the last qualifying meet in California before the trials in two thousand. And Mike Bottom had him lead off the relay at the last day of the meet, last afternoon of a three or four day meet. He said, "Gary, just go and see if you can make the cuts for the hundred free. Because if you can, it would be a good warm up swim for you. I don't. You don't have to worry. You're not. You know. You know. Not expecting to make." the team in the 100, but it would be a good warm-up swim for the 50. You get a swim under your belt, you probably swim faster than 50. He said, okay, I'll do that. He gets up and he makes the cut for the trials by a tenth of a second. <laughs> right. I mean, he was barely under the cut time. And the cuts in those days were really hard to make. They weren't, they weren't easy. Yeah. Uh, he goes to the trials and on the 100 free, he's in heat one. There's three swimmers in heat one. There's like only four or five heats at the trials. And he reels off like a 49-2. And he dropped his time like three seconds from this meet. Qualifies second and ends up getting second in the finals and makes a team. And, and so Gary never publicly talked about, well, I wasn't really trained for the hunt. He never said that. Yeah. I'm saying that yeah. as his dad, because I think if Gary had had the ability, the time to train for that hundred. I don't know if he'd have beat Peter Ronda Hooker, but he might have. He certainly would have. He got third anyway in the hundred free. Yeah. I think that was his greatest swim of all. Every swim in his Olympic career, and they were all fast. I consider that to be his best swim, 48-7, when he didn't train. Yeah. And, you know, he just did that one on guts. Um, but you know what? People don't know behind the scenes story. Yeah. Uh, all I can say is that it was great for Australia. You know, I, I would have loved to have seen Gary win that, but he didn't. He swam his heart out. And Ian, um, you know, he doffed his cap, as he said, to Ian at the end of the race, which I think made the Australians feel like, okay, this guy isn't so bad after all. Because Gary isn't that kind of guy. He's not going to He's cool. not gonna be, you know. Yeah. Uh, if, if somebody beats him, he's the first guy to shake their hand. Yeah. Yeah. And vice versa. He, he, he acknowledged him, went up to Michael Clem, who broke the world record leading it off, gave him a hug. And, you know, 
shake, shook the hands of all four of them, even though they were mocking him and, and realized, okay, they won the battle. They won this battle, but the yeah. war is not over yet. Yeah. And, and he went home and he regrouped. In fact, there was a, I mentioned this in the story, there was a Mark Schubert who was one of the head coaches of the men's team. Yeah. And the U.S. team was really down. I mean, we didn't have a great first day in those Olympics and we lost our relay. We'd never lost that before. So Mark Schubert called the team meeting. He, he went home, he said, uh, and I didn't know this. And, and he said, you know, hey guys, this is a seven days and this is a long meet, you know, we're gonna come back from this. Yeah. And, and with that, Gary Jr. stood up in the whole team meeting, men's and women's team. And he said, hey guys, we, we may have lost a battle. We haven't lost the war. Let's, let's come back on this. And we'll try it maybe, it, but they all did. And they had one of the best Olympic games ever. And yeah. from that second day on, the U.S. team just flourished. And of course, Gary won with Anthony in the 50 free. Yes. They won the medley relay, world record. He got third in the 100, which nobody expected him to even yeah. be there. So he, he did his thing. And, um, you know, he may always be looked at as the guy that didn't win that relay, but, you know, he, he had one of the best performances, especially that 100 free. Yeah. of his entire career. Yeah. So yeah. that was a great field, wasn't it? In that hundred free, um, an amazing field. <laughs> it was. It yeah. was Popov, Clem, um, Neil Walker from the U.S., Gary Jr., of course, Peter Van and Hugenbein, who was on fire there with his yeah. So he it was, was pretty amazing. Pretty amazing yeah. race. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gary, thank you so much for talking to us today. It's just been lovely. I feel like I've been speaking to swimming royalty. So it's just been lovely uh, having your having you on and, and getting your perspective and hearing about your swimming journey. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I hope that uh, I get to meet you in Australia or you come to Coronado and, and we can meet face to face someday. Yeah, I'd love to come along to one of those master's camps. I'll, I'll put it on my list. Please do. I, I promise you'll get faster and you'll have a blast. We have a yeah. great time. So four days though. Yeah. So that's, that's fun. That'd be great. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.